This episode is sponsored by the game Best Fiends. Researching for the show can, on some days, get a little heavy. And while I love doing it, sometimes I need a little break. That's when I pull out my phone, get comfortable, and launch my favorite palate cleanser, Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a fun and casual game filled with engaging puzzles to keep your brain entertained. Right now, I'm on level 422 and have found a new favorite character, JoJo, who is helping me through these new challenges, which, of course, update every month along with new levels, which means you never lose interest and you never get bored. What's really cool is that you can connect and play with friends from all over and create fun little challenges of your own, which is the perfect way to stay connected while still social distancing. And Best Fiends doesn't require the internet, so your gameplay won't be interrupted no matter where you are playing from. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Remember, that's friends without the R, Best Fiends. There were two more murders 15 miles away. When police arrived, they found the telephones and electricity lines. We have a weird homicide. The scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird... Medication isn't always the right answer when it comes to mental illness. On February 15, 2005, a young boy was convicted in a crime that would leave many arguing the pros and cons of medicating a young child. So, if you like your coffee hot but your bones chilled, sit back and start your day with a morning cup of murder. Christopher Frank Pittman, born April 9, 1989, was just 12 years old when he had his first run-in with the law. He ran away from home twice, threatened suicide, and was picked up and taken to a facility for troubled children where he remained for six days. At this facility, the care officials decided to prescribe him Paxil for what they believed was mild depression. When he was released, his father sent him off to South Carolina to live with his grandparents, hoping this would help to stabilize his son. And for a while, the move seemed to really help. Christopher's mother had left him twice already, and his father was, according to stories, an abusive man, so time with his grandparents seemed to do wonders for his mental state. Unfortunately, one small change was about to take place that would change Christopher's life forever. When he started attending his doctor's appointments in Chester, South Carolina, the office had no samples of his prescribed medication, Paxil. So instead of finding a way to obtain a dosage for him, the office simply gave him samples of a comparable medication, Zoloft. Now, if you've ever been on an antidepressant, then you know that not all pills are created equally. And you can't just change them out like you would a simple allergy medication or an Advil. Switching your medication, even the correct way, can have some unwanted side effects. Not only that, but Zoloft itself is known to have negative effects on children, such as aggravated depression, abnormal dreams, paranoid reaction, hallucinations, aggressive behavior, and delusions. Almost immediately, Christopher began experiencing those side effects, even being described by his sister as manic. He said he felt a burning sensation all over his body that was so painful, he required pain medication. At his next appointment, he explained his issues to his doctor, who, for reasons unknown, decided that the answer was to simply increase the dosage of the new medication from 100 milligrams daily to 200. The issue continued, and one day in late November of 2011, Christopher's aggression got him into an argument on the school bus that ended with him choking a second-grade student. And later that day, the piano player at the church's choir practice chastised him for kicking her chair, resulting in his grandfather pulling him outside of the church to speak with him. Realizing he was on a tailspin and not knowing the reason why, Joe and Joy Pittman threatened to send Christopher back to his father. Some sources claim that this threat was accompanied by a paddle spanking. Regardless of this tension, the threat, the anger, and possibly his body's reaction to the pills were all too much. And that evening, November 28, 2011, 12-year-old Christopher Pittman walked into his grandparents' bedroom with a shotgun in his hand and killed them as they lay in their bed. When he was sure they were dead, he set the house on fire, took his grandfather's truck, their guns, his dog, and $33, and drove off into the night. Early the next morning, two hunters came upon a young boy wandering in the woods, with a shotgun about two counties over. He told them that he'd been kidnapped by a black man who shot his grandparents and set their home on fire. That he escaped when the kidnapper got the getaway car stuck in the woods. They, of course, called the police. A search began almost immediately to try and locate the unknown black man, and in the meantime, an officer came to speak to Christopher to try and get a clearer picture of what had happened that night. Everyone believed Christopher. I mean, he was a 12-year-old boy who was found abandoned in the woods with two dead caregivers. It was difficult not to see him as a victim. But when the crime scene investigators started to do their work, small inconsistencies started to point to Chris as their main suspect. The officer took him into the conference room and told him they needed to have an adult conversation, and after he explained to Christopher what his Miranda rights were, the young boy broke down and gave a third and final statement to police. He remembered everything about that evening and claimed that there were voices in his head that urged him to kill and told him that his grandparents deserved what they got. He was arrested and charged with double homicide and arson. The case, given his age, became a media sensation and almost immediately, a case in Christopher's defense began. His father would later testify that the murder took place only two days after his dosage was doubled, further solidifying what everyone was suspecting, that this change in medication was the root of Christopher's evil act. This was the first case to arise amid an already heated debate surrounding the safety of prescribing children and teens antidepressants, and seemed like a pretty good example for the con side. Others, of course, thought this was simply a cop-out to try and get the young boy a shorter sentence. 
Christopher Pittman was brought to trial on January 31st, 2005, and was being tried as an adult. A psychiatrist for the prosecution who examined him stated that he knew exactly what he was doing the night he killed his grandparents, and said that the reason they knew this is because he attempted to cover up the crime by setting the home on fire. The defense worked to get the charge down to manslaughter on the grounds that the young boy's medication should not have been altered so dramatically, especially when there were known serious side effects. On February 15, 2005, a jury found Christopher guilty and he was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. After some appeal attempts and some issues with the jury, in December of 2010, Christopher agreed to a plea bargain in which he would plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter in exchange for a 25-year sentence. He is projected to be released in 2023 after spending the majority of his life behind prison walls. Thank you for joining me in my morning cup of murder. Please join me again tomorrow to hear what terrible thing happened on February 16th. Don't forget to rate and subscribe and let me know how you like it. If you want to help support the podcast, there's always Patreon or just sharing it with your true crime obsessed friends. And remember, stay safe.